Welcome to Highland Waves, coming to you from Marshbrook Studios on the banks of the wonderful Marguerite River in Cape Breton, Nova Scotia, Canada. At Highland Waves, we feature discussions with and stories about the people, the places, and the visitors of Inverness County. I'm Pat Wall, your host. With me in studio this morning is Eileen Cody, board chair of the 52-year-old Marguerite Area Development Association locally known as MATA. Welcome to Highland Waves, Ivy. Thanks, Pat. Thanks for the opportunity. Oh, you're very welcome. How long have you been chair of MATA? Uh, since uh, 2019, January of 2019. Your life began here in Marguerite? It, it did, basically. I, uh, I grew up here, and uh, yes. Briefly after high school, how was the journey? Oh, the journey was great. Uh, I went to St. Vex. I had a, a wonderful four years there, and then I, uh, I went into education. I taught for a year in British Columbia and then came back to Nova Scotia and uh, was able to get a job in, um, in Yarmouth, Nova Scotia. So I, um, I thought I was going for a couple of years and was going to work my way up the province and uh, uh, 35 years later, I retired from Yarmouth. Well, great. Uh, and you came back to Marguerite and put your feet into volunteering. I did, yes. Um, we moved home in uh, 2016. And um, from that point on, uh, you know, it, it was just great to be back. And I found that, you know, getting involved in some local activities and um, organizations. It just gave me a, um, a, a connection to the area and uh, met new people and, and reconnected with former friends. Well, well good to have you back. <laughs> Thank you. And did you volunteer in other communities that you were lived in, uh, in Armored, for example, when you were there? Yes. Now, during my teaching life, I was raising children, so I basically did those kind of volunteer things that you do as a as a parent, and uh, but it, when I retired, I was retired about six years before I moved home, and uh, so I did uh, a variety of volunteering there. And again, it, it's a way of connecting. Perhaps you can tell us how MATA got started. Well, from what I gather, uh, I was away at university in '72, but uh, my dad was involved, and I think there was a push around the island, uh, possibly led by DEVCO, to get um, um, uh, development um, associations going. Because I do know that in the first number of years, um, they did offer programs uh, locally for people. Um, I, I do know that there were weaving programs that were uh, kind of worked through uh, MATA and, um, pr um, you know, workshops on sheep raising, that kind of thing. So I think that there was a, a real push to get uh, MATA going. And um, in those early years, right at, through the 1980s, uh, the volunteers uh, had um, a week-long summer festival that was, you know, well enjoyed by many. And it was um, a lot of different activities, activities on the river, uh, activities, uh, you know, connected with uh, uh, the woodsman, um, craft uh, shows and concerts. So it involved a variety of the uh, villages of the Marguerites in various uh, activity. And then I think it evolved into uh, some more locally based um, uh, festivals like Belco Days and Northeast Marguerite uh, Fireman's Days around, you know, in the perhaps in the early 80s. And uh, so those are the uh, initial activities of MATA. And then around 1976, um, I think there was an initiative, it came from outside the community, in fact, to uh, perhaps commemorate in some way um, two of the... Um, of the gentleman from the Marguerites who had a, an impact on Nova Scotia and beyond, 
uh, Moses Cody and Jimmy Tompkins. And um, so there was um, work done. Uh, I think the idea kind of just uh, grew and uh, with government funding, uh, they decided to work on um, building a community library. So the, um, what had formerly been uh, the school grounds at Marguerite Forks um, in the early part of the 20th century, um, uh, that vacant uh, area was purchased by MATA, and uh, and it uh, and they built the library. So uh, the library was constructed around '77, I believe, opened in '78, and has been uh, a community library under Eastern Counties Regional Library System since that time. Well, thank you. Good history. Huh. What is MATA's mission now? Well, I think uh, Mattis' mission is evolving. Um, you know, uh, certainly um, 50 years later, some things have changed in the community and some things remain the same. But I think its mission is to support um, local initiatives, uh, to uh, build on the strengths that we have. Uh, our focus continues to be the library grounds, and I will talk probably more about that. Um, but um, the library um, maintaining the building and also uh, working to support um, a community base for that library here in the Marguerites, that's a significant function. And then I think working with other organizations. In the last couple of years, we have uh, worked uh, in conjunction more and more with uh, um, various organizations that are all doing really good things, but probably um, could communicate better with each other. So we have informal meetings now between, um, you know, uh, Marguerite Salmon Association, the museum, uh, various community centers, and uh, uh, Belcote and Cranton Crossroads, the Highland Games uh, group, um, and uh, and other groups as well, to kind of just be more informed on what they're doing, uh, so that we can work better together, and also that uh, if there are common concerns like um, you know uh, just uh, highways and roads, the the common frustrations that we have, signage. Uh, those kinds of issues, we can raise those concerns with provincial government and maybe be heard better because we're working together. How is MATA funded? Um, largely, it's funded by, by grants. Uh, you know, January and February are our grant season with many local, uh, local groups and associations. But uh, we also have um, very good community support. Um, you know, um, the, um, the local credit unions, the Marguerite uh, Co-op, um, those organizations often are, are um, you know, mainstays and other businesses as well, that when we're doing an event, they're right behind us to uh, support us with either material goods or some funding that helps. But we also have a very good connection with the municipal government uh, in Port Hood and uh, work very closely with Keith McDonald and the staff and our counselor uh, to, uh, you know, to work on issues that come up that we have to, uh, um, you know, um, cover. Um, and then also provincially, we have had funding for uh, programs and uh, projects. Uh, I can give you a couple of examples. Uh, in the last two years, we had, um, um, we wanted to do upgrades at the library. So uh, we uh, went through Efficiency Nova Scotia to uh, help us with uh, funding uh, heat pumps and new lights, um, uh, you know, more efficient lighting for the library. And those, uh, those projects were funded through provincial and municipal support. Are you you're a nonprofit organization? We are. Do you have a, a charitable status as well? No, uh, at this time we don't. It's something that um, possibly we would like to look into further, but not at this time. 
And how often do you meet? We meet monthly uh, uh, for uh, as a board. We're a board of eleven members, and we uh, we generally meet uh, between September and June on a monthly basis. Uh, our AGM is coming up May second, and uh, in the summer months we function probably more with um, um, a kind of a committee focus. So, uh, you know, if there are programs going on, people who are involved in in that particular project are working. But uh, our meetings are probably 10 a year. Uh, minutes of your meetings are available? They are uh, um, uh, on request, and we, uh, we try to keep them at the library if possible. MATA is open to everyone. It is. Which makes it a very diverse group especially in this area where you have, I think, nine margaries <laughs> along the river. Yeah. So I'm sure it is a challenge to get their ideas and uh, desires uh, under one roof. And uh, how do you do that? Do you have a, a representation from each of these areas on your board? We try very hard to do that. In fact, we just had a, um, just a, an in-house um, board strategic planning kind of session a couple of weeks ago on a Sunday afternoon, and it was to look at what, uh, what we are doing presently, what's working, what, what are our challenges, and where we would like to be five years down the road and what it's going to take in the next year to get there. So we, we, we recognize, and trying to answer your question there, um, that we do need representation, and we tend to have uh, reasonably good representation from around the communities, um, from Southwest, from East Marguerite, Belcote, uh, Northeast Marguerite, and, and the various Marguerites in that area, and, then the, and Marguerite Forks. If somebody wants to join your board, how do they go about that? Well, I would say uh, we are presently uh, working toward building our board for the coming year. Um, it's a three-year commitment, and we have a nominating committee working on, uh, on nominations for uh, the vacancies for, for the coming year. Volunteers are essential to any organization. Oh, well, they are. How do you go about keeping your volunteers and recruiting your volunteers? Well, uh, fortunately, we, over the last um, probably seven years, uh, we do have a website, a uh, Marguerite Area Development Association web website. Uh, it's called This Is Marguerite. And, uh, and that particular website kind of gives a sense of what we do. It's not always easy to keep uh, your website current, but we, we do attempt to do so. Uh, we also have um, a Facebook page, and in that way, we try to promote activities that are happening and, um, <clears throat> and advertise for volunteers. We, um, how do we keep volunteers? Well, it's like every organization. You try to um, support those that, that come forward. You try to um, value their, their uh, skills and the, the participation that they give you. And then you, uh, you hopefully are encouraging them to come back uh, another year. For example, we have a very active uh, Communities in Bloom committee, uh, active in the sense that they work uh, between spring, summer, and fall to, uh, to keep um, planters and uh, uh, container pots and a variety of uh, uh, little gardens going in the various areas. Now, we don't have uh, structured meetings, but uh, you know when the plants are ready in the spring, people take the, the planter pots, distribute them, water them during the summer, look after them. In the fall, we try to change it up and add a little bit of fall foliage to whatever we have. And, um, and those people um, have been coming back for probably about seven or eight years now and doing really nice work in little ways to, uh, to beautify our area. Nice. My understanding is that MATA's plan with municipal uh, input 
is to make what's referred to as the library grounds the community hub. Uh, there's been a study done, I understand? Yes. And uh, could you just uh, Give, elaborate on that a little, please? I will. Um, so in uh, 2019, we were approached by the municipal uh, government to, uh, uh, to look at having a comfort station on the grounds of, of, the, of the library. Uh, and of course, that, those grounds also house the Marguerite Meeting Place, which at one time was a medical building and it has been converted into a small meeting place. It's also the location of the Vista Information Center in the summertime. So um, a comfort station in the sense of washrooms, a uh, fancy name for washrooms, w uh, that was offered to us and we accepted the offer to have that. And also in connection with that um, building of that facility on, on the grounds, um, they were interested in doing a, um, a five-year kind of site assessment with us to uh, to kind of grow the grounds into a as you say a community hub and so that uh, study was uh, undertaken by Conrad Taves with uh, input from uh, the MATA board and we worked on um, kind of a focus for the the next four or five years now appreciate the fact that in 2020 uh, the world kind of uh, went on hold for a, a couple of years so um, the project has had several phases um, and in spite of COVID we have worked through uh, several uh, steps and we're in the process of working forward. Uh, initially it was to have a, a survey done of the property. We didn't have one, we got that done and from there uh, we worked on a walking trail around the perimeter of the property. Now, our property isn't huge, and it's not a, a grand hiking trail, but it allows people a safe, kind of comfortable walk. And if you do it several times around the perimeter, you've, you've probably got your, your steps in for the day. Uh, but it, uh, it allowed people, uh, or it, it is allowing people a chance to uh, walk uh, kind of on the uh, uh, northwest end, down around the brook end of the property, down toward the back. Now people could go further and go down uh, off our property uh, toward the river, but uh, you could circle around then and come back. Uh, and you're always within sight of the library. So for those who are interested in walking but are a little uncomfortable uh, being on the road or have little children and um, don't want to be on a busy highway, it is a, a, a very nice opportunity. So we built that. It includes um, uh, some benches. It includes some interpretive p panels. And uh, in the last year, we installed uh, solar lighting for the evening so you could walk a little later into the uh, into the evening. So that was phase one. Um, the next phase and one we're working on and have been working on for the last number of years is to build uh, a, an outdoor stage. Um, and we have grant uh, uh, applications in at the moment for, uh, for that pro part of the project. We're not looking to build a, a huge stage. It's an outdoor facility that could be used for uh, small concerts. It could also be a venue for uh, family gatherings, uh, anniversaries. We have had weddings on our property, outdoor weddings. So it, it would be a facility that could be u utilized by the community and, and just enjoyed. Um, so presently, uh, that will be, a, uh, we're looking at building it on the, uh, the back side of our property, kind of on the same side as uh, the comfort station, but with a, a very pleasant view for the audience of the, uh, of the river and the hills behind. So uh, uh, we have our fingers crossed. We have provincial grant funding uh, application at present. We've received m municipal funding and terrific municipal support in connection with it. Because we were waiting on, uh, on building it during COVID, we had our outdoor concerts the last three summers on the grounds, just under a kind of a canopy, canopy tent. 
but we recognize that people locally do enjoy coming to the grounds. We've done our concerts on Sunday evenings, and uh, I think people have uh, very much enjoyed the opportunity with the idea that uh, we would be rebuilding the stage that uh, had been there, and uh, hopefully 2024 is the year we will do it. Oh, nice. Back to the study for a moment. Was there an opinion poll or an opinion survey of the population with regard to the idea of making the Forks the hub or the community hub? Uh, I'm not sure about the Forks, but the library grounds. Well, I think what was recognized was that the grounds were underutilized. It's a beautiful location. It's lovely property. Uh, we do have a summer student usually. Uh, for the last multiple years, we've had uh, summer students who are groundskeepers. So we had uh, a property that has um, real potential. And I, I do believe that the municipality felt that the, that the grounds would uh, be one location in the Marguerites that could be a hub for activity. I, you know, I mean, there's so many beautiful locations in the Marguerites. Um, structured and unstructured that uh, people can go to, but uh, where the grounds are there, where the library is there, there is a comfort station or uh, washroom facilities available, um, and then of course the outdoor oven that is very appealing to many people, um, and then we had have uh, had the opportunity to put in the walking trail. I think there is, um, you know, the potential is there to make it. A, um, a, a lovely place to be. There's a lot of activities that do go on on those grounds, and you've mentioned a few of them. But one of the questions I have is the library. Besides lending books, what does the library do here? Well, it's interesting, Pat. There has just been a um, municipal uh, report on county libraries. It was released in January. And uh, that was done over the last um, uh, year and a half. There was an uh, opportunity for uh, input uh, by the public. There, uh, there were surveys and, uh, you know, a real effort to get a sense from the communities, uh, not just in Marguerite, but the other locations around um, the county that either have a, a library at present or would love to have one. Um, so so that input was incorporated into a, a study that was done by a firm from Halifax. And uh, we were very happy to finally uh, get to see the report fairly recently. And the report uh, recognizes and, and uh, gives voice to the fact that there are many people locally who see the library as more than just uh, a place to get books or to return books to. So, uh, yes, there is a definite uh, feel that the uh, libraries in the 21st century, and you can think of the big libraries like the one in Halifax and ones pe that people have visited elsewhere, they, ha they serve many purposes. So our library has uh, had opportunity. It really got hit hard during COVID, but has, has the opportunity to offer more than just uh, the lending service. And I mean, the lending service is wonderful for people, but you know, having programming there, uh, right now there, there are things going on and we're hopeful that with uh, input from, from the community and with the study to, um, to reinforce that, um, that they will be doing more, um, more programming there. One of the important things that the library does is that they provide the opportunity for people in the community to go and borrow a radon detector so they can go and test their own homes for radon. Yes. And since it's the second largest cause of lung cancer outside of smoking, I think it's important that the library, you know, provide that service and it's wonderful that they do that. And I don't know how many people are aware of that, but it's a very important asset for the community. Yes. Sorry. Um, I, I, I do know I was in re recently to pick up something at the counter, and I do know that they have uh, a notice there or a little uh, flyer that mentions that radar 
detector. I know we've used it at the uh, at the MATA building itself just for testing. But yes, I would encourage people to borrow it as a you know as just a a great resource to have available. One of the popular events that you hold at the library is in the summer with the literary event. Just talk about that a little. I will uh, now. Um, right now, our plans for 2024 are, are not totally settled. I'm hopeful that it may be happening. Uh, if it doesn't, we certainly will still be doing Canada Day events on the grounds. In fact, before I came this morning, I was working on a, a grant application in connection with our Canada Day Festival events. But in past years, uh, this uh, in 2023, it was our 11th annual um, uh, ca uh, literary event uh, at the library. And this um, uh, has gone on since the early 2000s. Now, during COVID, of course, there was, I think, a three three-year hiatus and we didn't have it, but uh, um, it w was initiated to bring in authors, both local and Atlantic Canadian authors, who would read from their books on uh, Canada Day at the library as kind of a, a, a celebration of, uh, of literacy, a celebration of kind of the, uh, the local character of uh, of uh, and talent of authorship in in Atlantic Canada, and to uh, to give people an opportunity to acknowledge the role of uh, Cody and Tompkins in that uh, you know in the the whole field of uh, uh, literacy, uh, lifelong learning, and and valuing libraries and education. That's wonderful. Before we run out of time, I want to give you an opportunity to tell us about some of the new projects that you've got coming up in the near future. Okay, uh, that is uh, that is uh, wonderful. Well, uh, first of all, um, the stage project is uh, is uppermost in our minds for, for this year. We're very hopeful that we can um, construct it and celebrate it uh, with some concerts this summer, and that would certainly be... Uh, um, a real valuing for, for going forward. The third phase, which I probably didn't mention uh, with, the, um, with the site development uh, plan, is that we also hope to have um, a playground on the, uh, on the ground. So once the stage is constructed and we have kind of locations a little more comfortable and, and set, we're, uh, we're looking at building um, a, a natural playground in that area, again, to add to the, the features that can bring people and uh, support our residents and our summer visitors in the Marguerites. I think another uh, uh, strong uh, hope for our, uh, our long-term plans would be that we're working together with other organizations uh, on a variety of fronts, um, it's really important. I think that we uh, we connect with the other community organizations because uh, together we can have more impact when we approach government if there are issues, um, and and so that uh, that would be um, another focus. And uh, our meeting place, which we really didn't talk too much about, on the grounds of the library. Is a is a facility that can uh, can support our uh, our communities, and uh, it's it it has a rental cost. But if if a group needed a, a place to meet, it's certainly a, a small f a facility that allows for group meetings, and uh, our our rental uh, space is very reasonable. Um, a final thing that I should mention and that has become a, 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 an issue and a support that we are are pleased with is we're working with the uh, food security groups in the Marguerites in the last six or seven uh, months to uh, to uh, build and uh, support uh, families, individuals, uh, children who who need that. So um, our our building, the Marguerite Meeting Place, is the location for the uh, the weekly uh, 
calling in for uh, the food vouchers that are part of uh, the initiative of uh, uh, a group and a, a committee separate from MATA, but a group that are, are working toward uh, supporting local uh, local um, initiative in that connection. And we have been working with the uh, local committee involved with uh, setting up the Meals on Wheels program for the uh, the Marguerite area. We um, we have allowed our um, uh, kind of our their application to uh, to be supported by MATA, which was uh, really important in going forward to the municipality. So uh, the Meals on Wheels program and the uh, food voucher programs that are uh, presently in place. Maybe uh, an unfortunate um, uh, situation that, uh, that uh, communities have to uh, recognize at, at present, but one that's so important. So we are uh, involved in that. In fact, at our AGM in May, uh, in addition to the, the usual a AGM activities, we plan a presentation on uh, food security and what's happening here in the Marguerites, and we're hopeful that people will find uh, that presentation informative. What are the biggest challenges MATA faces as we go forward? Well, like many um, organizations, and as I, I say to our MATA board, development associations across the um, uh, county, uh, always the challenge of... Uh, of involvement and uh, volunteers, um, as you say, holding volunteers, um, keeping them um, f so that they are not uh, burnt out from their uh, their activity, and also that they feel satisfaction in what they're doing for their communities. So I would say um, building and strengthening your board and working from that board to um, strengthen your community volunteer network, that's probably one of our big challenges and one that, uh, you know, is, is essential if, uh, if organizations like MATA can continue. And if you believe that community organizations are needed, and I certainly believe that, um, you know, you have to work to to build and support uh, th that volunteer base. Before we wrap up, is there anything else you would like to add? Well, uh, in preparation for this, I was listening to some of the other podcasts and uh, also noting, uh, you know, in terms of, uh, you know, the challenges of climate change in, in small areas. One of the uh, big challenges for a group like MATA is that, you know, with every rain event or flooding event, there are costs to infrastructure often, and that that creates some challenges for uh, small community groups as well. So uh, I'm, I'm not sure we can necessarily change the big picture of climate change, but, you know, working uh, locally to try to... Uh, strengthen our, um, our, our infrastructure and uh, to recognize that, uh, you know, every event has its, uh, its challenges for us. Well, Eileen, thank you for giving this information to our listeners. You've, done a, you've, sh you've shone a bright light on what MATA does, which is a lot. And I hope the people who you do it for rep represent uh, the whole area and that they are happy and that they are thankful for what you do for them. Uh, thank you to our listeners as well and of course the usual reminder to hit the like and subscribe button so you can let us know how we're doing and subscribing to Highland Waves is free and by doing so you stay up to date. The quote for today is, there is no power for change greater than the community discovering what it cares about. So long for now, Pat.